Right, I'm going to try and get through this quickly because I know you're here for the songs, not for the story about the songs. And I'm going to say that uh, most of what happened with uh, ballads, unsurprisingly, is about GAA, but also that the ballad tradition predates the foundation of the GAA. And we have the only thing we know about a lot of what happened uh, in sport, in popular sport, comes from ballads, not from newspaper accounts. That's a message or a theme familiar to anyone who follows uh, Frank Hart's thesis about winners writing history, losers writing the song. The only thing we know about, for instance, racing, a lot of hunting and prize fighting, which were the major sports alongside the people's sports of football and hurling from before the 1880s comes from the ballads. This would include how the game is played in some cases in the folklore sources and the Irish language sources for hurling. But horse racing enjoyed a, this huge boom in the 1740s. And very often what we get from the ballad is not really the events on the field, but their impact on popular culture. And there's no doubt a novel that happened between around 1745 and 1752 in terms of horse racing and popular culture. We have the names of 108 horses who won the King's Plate. Most of them are largely meaningless today, but something really exciting happened in the 1740s. And all we know about those horses comes from the ballads. We know their colors, we know their owners, sometimes we know their jockeys, but most importantly, we know that those horses could talk. We know that the Padre mare, when it came up against black and all black, had a conversation and we know that the great uh, Othello, Ballas Jack, which um, were featured on a major 1750s map, an illustration of this race, I think that thousand guineas was at stake at a time. We know about uh, Skewball, which was originally Skewball. He could talk as well. But let's go back to the Padre Mare because she was hugely significant. James Archibald of Eadstown owned this horse. And it, the difference between her and her opponent was she was Catholic and the opponent was Protestant. Right, it's not, the religion is less important than the fact that it was establishment. Ralph Gore was as establishment as you're going to get in 1750s Ireland. His father was Speaker of the Irish House of Commons and his father-in-law, William Connolly, who built Castletown House, he was Speaker of the Irish House of Commons. He bought this horse called Othello. For some reason, he called him Black and All Black when he raced in Ireland. Now, we don't know if she ever raced against the champion mayor at the time, but the champion mayor at the time was white. You can see an Ashling theme creeping in here. And the horse was Catholic, or at least uh, the Archibald family who owned the horse in Eadstown were Catholic. So the Padre mayor got her name from the fact that she, when she raced, she had rosary beads around her neck. And this immense event, Catholic Ireland against Protestant establishment Ireland, as I say, the establishment being more important than the religion, just captured the mood of the people. Both were winners of the King's Plate, and we don't know whether they raced against each other, but this is 1749 and it's Henry Brook. Henry Brook wrote musical plays, uh, performed in Dublin. It was the sort of highlight of the year, Brooke's latest play. His brother, he lived in Kildare, not far from where I am here, uh, between Salons and Clane he lived, and his brother uh, found it, uh, a town or a factory, a couple of four factories on a crossroads on the edge of the bog and decided this place was going to be very prosperous. So he called the place prosperous. Uh, it wasn't prosperous. Brooke went bankrupt in 1786, had to be bailed out, but he did give us uh, a seminal name for one of the great Irish music albums, uh, the uh, predecessor of Clangsty. So thank you, Henry Brooke's brother. Back to Henry. He put the Padre Mare in his play, Jack the Giant Killer, you know, pretty straightforward uh, musical play, but it became apparent to everyone who went that all the characters in Jack the Giant Killer were identifiable members of the Dublin Castle regime. And that the Padre Mare was the ballad put in the middle of it. And of course was joined in enthusiastically 
by uh, the ordinary people of Dublin. I don't know if Des Geraghty's ancestors were amongst them, because here was Catholic Ireland defeating Protestant establishment Ireland in a horse race. Jack the Giant Killer was shut down by the authorities the night after it opened. But the ballad lived on in several versions of it, and it was picked up. I first came across it as a footnote in Patrick Weston Joyce's um, 1906 uh, Irish Airs, um, and he told the story, or he footnoted the story of the Padre Mayor there. It was published 1906. William Carlton referenced it in his work, and it's sometimes retrospectively attributed to Oliver Goldsmith. A few years later, the same horse, 1752, uh, Black and All Black, it's up against Skewball. It's owned by Randall MacDonald from County Antrim. Uh, Skewball, again, a ballad, the horse gets to talk. But this ballad showed up on the other side of the Atlantic, becomes very influential. Uh, Woody Guthrie recorded, ended up in the folk circuit, the pop circuit indeed in the 1960s, and an inspiration to John Lennon, War is Over, the Christmas Anthem. Horse racing isn't the only headline sport of the 1700s. Prize fighting was there as well. Tomás Lodger, Irish language tradition, he fights for a title and wins. And it's not quite sure whether Tomás, who Tomás Lodger was. But remember also that uh, when you drive to, when you used to drive on the old road, uh, to from uh, Pastor Molan Castle to Milltown Malbay to the way uh, events down there and to the, the great sessions down there, you would pass uh, Belvedere on a hill which was built by Edward O'Brien. I was always told by my uncle Dennis that this was the grave of a horse called Sean Bui, but Sean Bui doesn't show up in all that list of 108 King's Plate winners, but oddly enough, more than 30, 31 of those winners were owned by Edward O'Brien, who used the Belvedere to watch his horses in training. So we don't know um, what Sean Bui, uh, one of his great um, dairy maids, which won five King's Plates, or Lottery, which won four of them, a uh, huge percentage proportion of those races from those forgotten races, the oft forgotten races from the 1700s, were won by Edward O'Brien. Even his town, Newmarket on Fergus, gives you a hint of how obsessed with racing he was. It might be something to do with the O'Brien name. We had Vincent O'Brien, and now we've a Aidan O'Brien. If you want to be a winner in racing, just you know, change your name to O'Brien. But back to prize fighting, and there's no scientific basis for this. I think it's uh, relevant that William Kelly, the man who invented Dan Donnelly, the promoter of the time, uh, was an Nillan Piper. He would have known the power of ballads. So we had this flood of ballads about a prize fighter called Dan Donnelly. Anyone who's been to the hideout pub in Kilcullen uh, when his arm was on display there, yes, it's a fake. But Dan Donnelly's legend uh, far outranked what anything he achieved. And he would basically uh, was involved in two major prize fights, which drew huge crowds of 20,000. They weren't for the unofficial world to prize type, uh, fight title at the time, but they did involve Ireland, a uh, boxer from Ireland against a boxer from England, which we'll see was the key to how the ballots really took hold. There was a guy called Dan Doherty. He had actually won the international prize fight title before Donnelly, but he didn't have the power of a promoter like Ilan Piper, William Kelly behind him. So um, he didn't make it to the ballots. Doherty's hollow in the Curra, um, the final ignominy was it's still known today as Donnelly's hollow, whereas Donnelly won uh, nothing and Doherty won the title. Um, lots of uh, help from the fact that Dan Donnelly died young. Uh, this is Hibernia lamenting the death of her great prize fighter, uh, Dan Donnelly. And of course, the prize fight uh, tradition ballad, um, people would be very familiar with Morrissey fighting the Russian sailor. Um, it sometimes involved marketing. If you got your, your hero sung about in um, the streets of Dublin, it certainly would have helped your ability to make money out of it in the same way that the newspapers of the 1880s, 1890s 
um, used boxing to increase their circulation and indeed paper television pay-per-view television does now with the likes of Conor McGregor. I haven't seen any Conor McGregor ballot yet, but I'm no doubt uh, that will come. Which brings us to the 1867 uh, Waterloo Cup, Ireland against England. Again, nobody has heard of the Waterloo Cup. It's a coursing event. Coursing is so out of fashion that uh, it, it's hard to believe. But the only reason anybody uh, can even think about the Waterloo Cup nowadays is because of this Ireland versus England battle. The dog called Lobelia was renamed Rose, champion of England for the ballot. And we have this notion that five, odds of 5,000 to one were given on a two horse race. Uh, no bookie would even go near that. But it's a fabulous, fabulous song. And of course, we, Rose and Master McGraw, both have a conversation in the course of it. Well, I know, says McGraw, we have wild heather bogs, but o'er in old Ireland, there's good men and dogs. Lead on, bold Britannia, give none of your jaw, enough up your nostrils, says Master McGraw. The hair she led off in a beautiful view, as swift as the wind o'er the green hills she flew. He jumped on the back and he held up his paw. Give three cheers for old Ireland, said Master McGrath. A lot of talk recently about Cheltenham and our terrific 22 victories in Cheltenham this year. The uh, Cheltenham was invented for Ireland in around 1948. Vincent O'Brien, better known as a flat horse trainer later years, he started a national hunt and uh, Cottage Rake in 1948 was his seminal victory. Ballads up and down the country. Aubrey's up, the money's down, the frightened bookies quake. Come on, my lads, and give a cheer. Be God, tis cottage rake. And in keeping with the fact that the event is bigger than the actual race, the 1960s, uh, Arkell against Millhouse. Come at the year, come at the man, come at the horse, and come at the ballot. Dominic Bean wrote the ballot of Arkell, dominated the charts in a way that sporting ballots probably never do and of course it was Ireland against England uh, including the mock uh, Oxford accent finish where the English give the excuses why Milhouse didn't win. English say the ground was around the distance along too early in the day. I come from North Kildare uh, very near uh, here is Alasti where Pat Taff lived. He was the jockey on Arkell and a little bit to the other direction is where Arkell was born, a field near Minutes and later buried. But um, in between about if you cross what's gloriously known as the Painstown River, but it's actually only about eight inches deep and two feet wide. And you cross two fields, one of which was the where Tetrarch was foaled back in 1911. You come to the house where Willie Robinson's mother uh, grew up. Um, Willie Robinson was on top of Millhouse. He was the rider of Millhouse and uh, he lived in Minutes at the time. He, ro he uh, rode Millhouse. It's a very Kildare affair. Millhouse her, uh, himself, the big horse, was born about four fields in the other direction near Kill. In fact, when Millhouse was very young, a young jockey called Pat Taff had schooled Millhouse. So <clears throat> you ended up with this internecine uh, between a couple of fields in North, in North Kildare turning into he's English, he's English, he's English as they get uh, for Millhouse and Arca beating him. Uh, in that terrific uh, 1964 Cheltenham Gold Cup. I, you know, sports is about a coming together of events and a lot of it's the pageantry, the pageantry of this massive horse and this uh, wayward article, almost a Paul McGrath of horse racing, because even with, you know, you can see um, not exactly the horses conversing as they used to do in the days of the Padre Mare, but you can see Pat Taff trying to rein in <clears throat> this incredible talent uh, between uh, beneath him, uh, Arkell, and make sure he wins the race in a structured fashion. Very Irish versus English in the uh, pageantry and indeed in the popular culture of the 1960s. And of course, you still have ballads about horse racing, um, all about national hunt. The, um, the running for three quarters of a mile on the flat for the Derby or the Oaks, uh, with Sheikh Mohammed always owning the winner 
and uh, that doesn't really capture the imagination. Everybody knows real racing is up to five miles or over fences and horses like, uh, well, jockeys like uh, Ruby Walsh, Christy Moore did a song about Ruby Walsh to the air of the Galway races. And uh, Billy Morrissey from Tipperary has just written the ballad of Rachel Blackmore, uh, recorded, I think, by Nick Foster. And of course, the GAA ballad goes back a long, long way. Uh, Thomas Croft and Croker, without exaggeration, our goalers take their station for the highest approbation they have won their victory. T'was in no combination or field association, but in rural relaxation on the plains of Onabui. Slave Roo was the pen name in 1914 that thought that these iconic four lines sum up hurling better than anything I've ever heard. Sport with a dash in it, clatter and clash in it, something with ash in it, surely a game. And another quartet which sums up hurling from Crawford Neal in 1916. Give a rose to a maid or silken braid. Give a singer his songs full measure. But give me a lad whose heart is glad with the wit of a field for his pleasure. J.B. Dollard wrote this tribute to hurling from Tipperary, where else? Moond Harrick, Moond Harrick, ye leaped into the fray. Moond Harrick, Moond Harrick, how gloriously that day. Moy Karki and Moond Harrick, a stubborn fight ye fought. Moond Harrick, Moond Harrick, what wonder works ye wrought. And Kildare's tribute to its greatest sporting heroes, probably by Patrick Ramsbottom. Three non parais Kildare can claim, honourable, clean and manly. Their names can grace the Hall of Fame. Dempsey, Conef. And Stanley. Jack Dempsey, the original Jack Dempsey, he was originally Jack Kelly from Clane, didn't want his da and his ma to know he was doing something as disreputable as boxing, so he changed his name to Jack Dempsey and he won the very first uh, middleweight world title. He died in the USA, he's buried in Portland, Oregon, I had the pleasure of uh, going to pay tribute at his grave and a little bit further down the coast you'll find the grave in San Francisco of Tommy Kniff. For 20 years he held the record for the mile, the world record for the mile, a uh, small runner from Plain and he uh, didn't go to the 1896 Olympics because he didn't think it was important enough otherwise he would have been the first 1500 uh, gold medalist. Larry Stanley a uh, hero of the 1919 Kildare team, uh, didn't get to play in 27 and 28, always a little bit of suspicion. His brother was a gambler, uh, Kildare team, you can see popping up again and again. And there was a suspicion that Larry wasn't performing at the highest level because his brother would occasionally put a bet against Kildare. And where we have Tipperary, we have to have Kilkenny. The lightning puck, the flashing stroke, their every brilliant score, the clean and risky stick works, of the hurlers from the Nor. And then the fictitious character, the bold Teddy Quill, wasn't real. He was a guy apparently based on a real character by Johnny Tom Gleason, who wrote the ballad because in his head uh, he used to spin yarns of his heroic exploit. At the great hurling match between Cork and Tipperary, just played in the park by the banks of the Lee. Our own darling boys were afraid of being beaten, so they sent for Bold Hady to Ballin agree. And of course, uh, for rambling and roving and football or sporting and drinking black porter as fast as your fill, uh, Bold Hady won the match for Cork. Um, Kerry produced a lot of ballads and Kerry arose uh, 1900, it hadn't won anything for the first 20 years of the GA and had been making up for it since. And this was given to me by the poet Brendan Kennelly, um, really just sums up how GA ballads um, gain currency, a free to Kerry, Con Brosnan took it with steady foot and unerring aim, he scored the point and again we led them towards the final point of the hard fought game. Hats off to Brosnan, our midfield wonder, his par excellence in feet and hands. Oh, where's the gale can pull down the number of Kerry's idol from Newtown Sands. And of course, the great Sigurds and Clifford, author of The Boys of Borna Shroja, Hunting for the Ram. We still chalked up the scoreboard 
and the chalk was green and gold, said the tailor, white teeth grinning like a shark. Sure, we only took their measure and we'll cut their claw to scale when next we take the ghost train for Croke Park. The ghost train central to Kerry tradition, not because there were ghosts on it, but because it left shortly after midnight and uh, in case the turf would go teetotally out as Percy French wrote, um, it took a long time to get to Dublin to get to the match. Uh, that was written about the 1926 All-Ireland final. Kerry and Kildare drew and Kerry won the replay as the tailor predicted. Uh, this is an example of how the GA has changed, by the way. Um, this is Joe Lachlan coming out. He's about to play in the All-Ireland final and he goes over to his mate for a cigarette, how times have changed. And of course, the great Brian McMahon, uh, this is the Ballad of Christy Ring, how oft I've watched him from the hill move here and there in grace, in Cork, Killarney, Thurless town, or by the Shannon's race. Now Cork is bet, the hay is saved, the thousands wildly sing, they speak too soon, my sweet Garsoon, for here comes Christy Ring. The hay saved and cork bet is a great monster phrase. I don't know if it works for the hay being put into roundy bales. And Brian McMahon wrote the uh, ballad of Tommy Daly. Tommy Daly died tragically in September 1936. He played in the All-Ireland final for Clare just four years before. Um, Brian wrote the, published the ballad within days, uh, certainly within weeks of the death of Tommy Daly and it's uh, iconic ballad. Uh, wherever Clare does battle and whoever guards the goal, whene'er the citadel is saved, the proud noble soul of Sterling Thomas Daly, they shall recall and say, God rest you, Thomas Daly, on your wine-swept hill today. And Robbie McMahon, the man who uh, popularised Spansill Hill, uh, there goes Mrs. Colleran and she puffing at a fag. She's shouting back to someone saying, we have it in the bag. And good old Mother Corbett, the best old gale of all. She never missed a hurling match from springtime to the fall. We have to thank the GA for something else. It's the county anthem. The Artane Boys Band will play something from both counties before a major match in Croke Park. And that meant that counties had to be assigned songs. <clears throat> Where did this come from? Hard to track. There was community singing <clears throat> introduced in the 1920s at major matches in England. Uh, at Wembley, the Abide With Me would being the most famous example. Uh, the Irish equivalent would have been at, more so at the Railway Cup finals, which were held in Patrick's Day, when Faith of Our Fathers was sung by the crowd quite a moving uh, sound and something that wouldn't be politically correct nowadays. But there was also community singing and it's hard to imagine that Cavan in 1948, uh, the community singing included the Flower of Finet. It's beyond me how you can get a crowd of 70,000. Bright red is the sun on the waves of Loch Sheelan to sing something like <clears throat> that great Thomas Davis uh, composition. There are three county anthems that are untouchable. The Banks of My Own Lovely Leaf, Steve Damon, and The Rose of Moon Coin. Everything else gets interchangeable. Some of them are quite modern, uh, beautiful meads, the awfully uh, rover, lovely leitrim. Um, lovely leash, there seems to be a theme here. It used to drive Jimmy Smith quite bonkers that the Rose of Clare would be played. When you consider Clare's musical tradition, this is what the Artane Boys Band played. Um, 20 Men from Dublin Town was what they played in 1958 when Dublin uh, played Derry in the All-Ireland Final. But by 1974, that had gone to Molly Malone, Rose of Tralee being used for Kerry. Again, when you consider the great tradition, this was uh, a parlor song where William Mulchinock wrote it. Um, even Galway Bay, another uh, song written not exactly for Bing Crosby, but written in England and more parlour music again, uh, replaced by the ubiquitous Fields of Bath and Rye for Galway in recent years. And of course, Paddy very pointedly sang the entire Pocar Builla from the podium when he captained Kerry to an All-Ireland 
The Curra of Kildare cobbled together from an old songbook by Donald Lunny uh, that served as Kildare's anthem, although the roads of Kildare, I notice, uh, popping up in functions in Kildare more recently. And songs do get changed. Um, the Boule of Oak, unquestionably the anthem of Wexford, but Dancing at the Crossroads, which was written for a GA victory in 1996, uh, more or less replaced it as the anthem. The ballad tradition in soccer is more complicated because it was an urban sport. The towns that played soccer tend to concentrate around British Army garrisons. An exception was the Northwest uh, Hibernian in Edinburgh won what was called the World Cup uh, in 1880. They won the Scottish Cup. Uh, Preston North End won the English Cup. They played off and Hibernian won. There were bonfires down the west of Ireland and Hibernian only picked Irish-born players. Uh, their offshoot in, uh, their Catholic offshoot in Glasgow, Glasgow Celtic, um, would pick uh, non-Irish born, but Hibernian was resolutely Irish at the time. And there were some ballads to commemorate Hibernian. But interestingly enough, when Christy Moore was looking for an urban equivalent of his rural ballad, uh, Liz Varna, he looked to soccer and the 1988 experience with Jack Charlton, the Euros, um, Joxer goes to Stuttgart. The soccer song, as we know, tends to uh, emanate from the terrace songs in England. They would all the tunes for the early versions of this. Um, oh Jehovah thing would have burned it up as we'll support you evermore um, it was the tunes that they knew from going to church when people used to go to church and then from their schools they became the supporter songs and our interesting supporter songs in the context what we're talking about tonight would tend to be from uh, the Celtic Rangers rivalry in Glasgow on the Celtic side, you'd have, I'm a roaming in the gloaming with a shamrock in my hand. I'm a roaming in the gloaming with St. Patrick's Fenian band. And when the music stops, fecking Billy and John Knox, it's great to be a Roman Catholic. Lots and lots of them, and some of them very funny. They would sing a nation once again quite regularly at those matches on the Rangers side. <clears throat> Do I know where hell is? Hell is in the falls. Heaven is the Shanker Road and all the rest. And uh, the most um, famous of the recent ones was uh, The Famine is Over. Why don't you go home? Which um, is quite uh, funny, you know, it's a nice, gentle, if sectarian jibe. The verses are much more ferocious and the song is obviously banned, as are songs which you wouldn't expect to be banned. I did not realise that uh, Hokey Pokey was a caricature of the Latin Mass, an anti-Catholic song, because uh, Protestants would say that Catholic Mass was just hocus pocus, and um, Hokey Pokey, Here's the Dance You Should, was banned uh, among the Ranger supporters because somebody realized they were actually having a go at the Catholics. I think it's marvelous that one of the best GA ballads doesn't actually mention the player uh, it's about. Tom Williams, uh, Coo Collins' son, makes no mention whatsoever about Nicky Rackard. And sometimes uh, people singing it forget to introduce who this is about. It's of personal interest to me because I was commissioned by the Irish Independent to write the obituary for Paddy O'Shea. And uh, I thought, how am I going to do this without mentioning the fact this man was an alcoholic? Uh, everybody else is going to do that, so I'm going to look out if I don't. So I stole that marvellous finale from Tom Williams' ballad about meeting the devil in the street. And I put that in and people who knew the ballad would refer to it. And it didn't actually say uh, Paddy was an alcoholic. And 
then, of course, I read all the other obituaries and I'm the only one. Uh, Mihola Marahertig in that terrific accent they only have in Doon Sheen said Paddy loved to go to pubs in his tribute on Morning Ireland. So I was alone, uh, the devil passing in the street. But very interestingly, Paddy's long-suffering wife, when uh, I went down to the funeral, that sad day in Ventry, and Kian Thra and uh, shook her hand. She said, you were the only one. So thank you, Tom Williams, for giving me the out on that. And thanks to Sen and Lillis, I discovered another uh, Nicky Rackard ballad at the Chapel Gate Singers last week. Uh, it's written by Mary Hickey from Rathmuir, and it won the uh, PJ McCall, H. PJ McCall in Rathangan in South Wexford in 1981. Uh, another ballad, of, terrific ballad of Nicky Rackard. Having a tragic life like Nicky Rackard or dying young like PJ Duke is always good um, career move if you want a ballad uh, written about you. But um, Tommy, the ballad of Tommy Daly is inspirational for other reasons. It was the signature of Jimmy Smith, the great player of that team in 1955, which should have won the Munster Championship and the All-Ireland Championship indeed. And it inspired him to collect GA ballads back in the 90s, then inspired uh, ballad books in a lot of counties. I know the Cork one, I have a shelf of them here. Uh, the Cork one is enormous and they commemorate almost lots of club titles, things like junior and intermediate club titles, which would not make national significance. Follows a format where very often uh, there's two lines and even four lines for each player on the field. Uh, they go through the, the game and sometimes the fans, Robbie McMahon's ballad is great because it brings the fans in. Uh, Fintan Vallely wrote a tribute to Milton Mulby, St. Joseph's winning in 1985. It attracts songwriters because um, for a short period anyway, the songs are sung. They're not sure how many of them are sung in the long term, but we, what uh, Jimmy did was started the collecting of uh, these ballads, which might not have shown up elsewhere, and we owe him an awful lot for that. The late Jimmy Smith, here he is with his signature uh, ballad of Tommy Daly. Oh, we shall recall and say, God rest you, Tommy Daly, and your wine sweat till today. Again, he'll dine with life some air. The clatter of gold of Tulla, not in the blue and gold of clear. The cups they'll pray when face are high and till the wounds are fight. God rest your Tommy Daly and your wine sweat till tonight. Oh, beyond this place of tide and tears, beyond this plain of woe, there is a bone in paradise where all the hurlers go, and there in prime they're calling and race across the sand and trill out dead for fathers on the level long of God on the wine swept till of taller within those breasts so deep with dreams of resurrection on a thousand tall asleep and with them Tommy Daly for yours above his hand on the wine swept till of taller, where the clear men place their dead.